Well, good morning to all of you at James River and to Pastor John and to us here at Puford Road. Good morning to you and Pastor Mac and all of you who are joining us online. It's good to have you with us on this Pentecost Memorial Day weekend. Now, I need to tell you right up front that apart from Easter and apart from Christmas, Pentecost is one of my favorite Sundays in the church calendar. It's one of my favorite Sundays because it speaks some truth to us in ways we don't get to hear it at other times of the year. And I love it because it's a strange story. And I'm attracted to really strange stories. And it doesn't get much stranger than this story. It happens 50 days after Jesus is raised from the dead, hence Pentecost. Isn't it hard to believe that already 50 days have gone past since we've had Easter? But here we are, 50 days. Here they were, 50 days, 120 men and women. They were frightened. Actually, they were terrified. Because they had seen all the prejudice against them. Everything seemed to be against them. The movement seemed to have died. Everything seems to have come to a grinding halt for them. So 120 men and women who are followers of Jesus Christ gather into this small little space and something happens to them that day that literally changes the world. You want to know what kind of influence you have? It only took 120 people to change the whole world. Well, folk, we're beyond that in this room right now. So you got 120 people in a room, terrified, and this huge wind comes into the room. And that wind is so strong, but it does something. All of a sudden, they discover they have a courage they didn't even know what they ever had. They have abilities and skills they never dreamed of having. They could speak in their language, and everyone in a different language would understand what they said. All of a sudden, there was a courage in them, and they were willing to go out of that room into the world with that wind ringing in their ears. And when they went out into the world, you know what the world's response was? Those people are nuts. They're crazy. Actually, they appear to be drunk. This is followers of Jesus. They're a bunch of drunkards. Some of them listened a little deeper. 3,000, in fact. And 3,000 said, uh-uh, they're not crazy. They're not drunk. Tell you what they are. They're alive, and whatever they got, I want some of it. And 3,000 of them that day joined the church. Can you imagine growing from 120 to 3,120 in one day? Pretty good day. So my question today is, what happened to them? Could it happen to you and I? Could it happen to us? What happened that day? And for me to understand what happened that day, I have to take you to another story. It's a much older story. It's an ancient story. It is equally a strange story. But it will explain to us everything that happened to that 120 in the room. Listen to this story. It starts with a man named Ezekiel. And everybody thought Ezekiel was crazy and nuts. And he probably was a little bit. And this guy is crazy and nuts because he has some of the weirdest visions you can imagine. They're the kind of visions you really don't go out in public and talk about because people begin to wonder if you're safe to have walking around in the public arena. He has those kind of visions, and the most famous vision he has is a vision of a valley of dry, dead 
bones. I want you to try to imagine seeing what Ezekiel saw. It says in the text that the Spirit came and led him into this valley. My hunch is this morning that same Spirit is in this room and is about ready to take a walk with you into this valley. See what Ezekiel sees. Not long ago, a battle had just been fought in that valley, and thousands, it was a horrific battle, and thousands lay dead in that particular valley. They, they were killed. And as time passed, whether it was weeks or months, we don't have any idea. But as time passed, the elements, the wild animals, the birds, whatever, they do what they do. And they had picked those bones dry. Those bones were bleached white in that hot Mideastern sun. Imagine this valley with piled up bones and bones scattered all over the place. You had leg bones, arm bones, rib cages. You had grinning skulls with lizards and scorpions scuttling in and out of, of those particular bones. These were Ezekiel's people. And they were dead. And they were defeated. And they were discouraged. Can we pause here for just a moment? What I like about Pentecost is it gives you and me and us together here at James River and here at Buford Road, it gives us an opportunity to speak to the deadness and the dryness that's in our lives. And folks, we can be pretty dry, and we can be pretty dead. You don't have to go to a battlefield and see it full of dead bones and skulls and lying there. It's all around us. It's within us all the time, that deadness, that dryness. It's in every single one of us. A waiter can come up to you at the table, and you know what the waiter says? So what do you want? I'll come back when you've made your mind up. You know what I want to say? Could you at least say that with a smile? I mean, you can even fake the smile. I'll take that. If you would just smile when you say that, it would be a better experience for the two of us. And I guarantee you, when it comes time to, to leave a tip, I'll, can kind of, I'll consider that smile. It doesn't matter how good you are, or how talented you are, none of us enjoys being around dryness. Isn't that true? None of us like that. And what I've discovered is when we feel dead inside and when we feel dry, you know what we typically do? We blame it on somebody. Let me tell you where I see the blame most often these days when I'm talking with churches. I love this one. I'm talking with them, so well, you know, we don't have the young people anymore. We don't have the young adults. We don't have the teenagers. We just don't have, matter of fact, we've even closed off that section of the church. I can't tell you how many times, hundreds, I've had that particular conversation. I don't know what's wrong with these young people today. You know, they just don't see church as important. They make everything else priority, and they're blaming the young people. And I'm going, now, folk, if one person leaves you, that might be on them. But if five leave you, that's probably you. And you have some work to do. Well, I'm just trying to keep it real. No, you're not. You're just trying to keep it broke. We tend to blame folk. Why are we experiencing such deadness and dryness inside? Is it the stress? Are we just 
tired. Do you know what the definition of tired is? It's when the sense of life in you is exhausted. You've lost it. A minute ago, I just read something from Mandarin. The Mandarin, the Chinese language, has a character. They don't do words in phonetics like we do in English. They're characters. And what characters are is they're pictures. There's words put to, pictures put together that create words. So the word for being busy, which probably most of in this room are too much of, they put the word they create for business is made up of for busyness is made up of two pictures. One picture is the heart. That being busy involves your heart. The other picture they put with that is death. When you are busy, your heart is dead. You can't even remember what it was that you just did. You were so busy, you weren't even alive. And folk, when we lose our sense of life and it's exhausted out of us, we become a dry place. We become dead bones. That's the lady who cuts your hair, who says, lean your head back, put your head down, be still. How did she get to be such a dry place? You know, it happens in marriages. Deb and I, this past week, we were up at Cracker Barrel. And we were sitting there talking to each other. Actually, Deborah was telling me how much fun she had had that day. Where we live, there's a farm attached to it. And she had worked on the farm. And I'm glad I have two ears, because one ear I was listening to her. I'll tell you what my other ear was doing in just a minute. But I was listening to her, and I was intrigued by what she was saying, because she was telling me how much she enjoyed thinning out carrots. Who enjoys thinning out carrots? But Deb was having a great time, and whoever was with her, they just must have had great conversations. So I was intrigued by what she was telling me about thinning out carrots. But my other ear, I saw this couple two tables over for us. They were there when we got there. And the entire time we sat there waiting for our food, ordering and eating, they were just sitting there and had not said one word to each other. Now, I'm intrigued by that. I don't know how you pull that off. And they weren't looking at devices. They weren't looking at their cell phones. They didn't have anything they were reading. She was staring off in one direction. He was staring off in another direction. They didn't seem to be mad at one another, but they did. I was wondering, how long can you pull that off? Well, finally, we finished eating, and Deb said, while you're waiting for the check, I'm going to go roam around in the store. I said, sure, I'll be out there in just a minute. So I'm sitting there, and finally, she speaks. Well, what you been thinking about? You know what he said? Nothing. <laughs> they brought me the check, and they gave me the check, and I stood up to go pay for it, and finally someone said something again, and she said, well, what's, what you, what's on your mind? Nothing. <laughs> I wanted to go over to her and say, was he this way when you married him? If he were, shame on you. We can do a marrying a stump. But it was more terrible than that, I think. I don't think he was that way when they got married. And I wanted to ask him, what has happened to you over the years that you've become such a dry, dry place? And Ezekiel walks among the dry bones. There's a question in his mind that's rising to the surface, and he identifies that as not his question. That's actually the Lord's question that's asking him, Ezekiel, can these bones live again? 
We know that question. We ask that question all the time. Like Ezekiel, can these bones live again? And folk, when that question enters your mind, that's probably not your question. That's probably God's question inside of you rising up like a voice. Can these bones live again? Your marriage has become dull and painful. Your hopes have been dashed into disappointments. Your your body's grown tired and cold. Will life ever feel normal again? Will I ever be happy again? Will, Will I ever not be so stressed out in my life? Folk, your life and my life, we were not meant to live such disconnected, disjointed, scattered lives. Will the church of Jesus Christ ever stop feeling more like a valley of dead bones? Will it ever feel like the living body of Christ again? So God says to Ezekiel, as he says to you this morning and to me and to us as a church, can these bones live? Do notice that Ezekiel doesn't say yes any more than you'll say yes. He doesn't answer with a yes. What he answers with is a sigh. Lord, Only you know. Only you know. And so the Lord says to Ezekiel, you go speak to those dead bones. Do you know how much fun I could have right now? I've been doing that for 50 years. You go speak to those dead bones. And you say to those bones, oh dry bones, you hear the word of the Lord you shall live and you shall know that the Lord is your God. And all of a sudden, all over that valley was a tremendous, incredible noise. There was the sound of rattling of bones. There was the sound of snapping. There was the sound of knocking and clicking as those bones came together, bone to bone, and they started forming skeletons, and the skeletons started putting on sinew, and they started putting on tendons and muscles, and they put on hair and grew organs, and they had skin All of us, and wouldn't you love to see what Steven Spielberg would do with that? (laughs) A miracle happened right there in that valley. But be careful. That miracle turned out to be more horrendous than what it was before. What it was before was just a valley of very bleached white dry bones. What it is right now is a valley of a thousand dead bodies. It was a valley of corpses. It was more horrendous after the miracle than it was before. What this is trying to tell you and I is this. And church, we do need to do our study. We do need to do our research. We do need to do our future planning, our strategic planning. We need to do all the things to know where we're going, who we are, what it is that we feel called to achieve. Just as in our personal lives, we need to try to get ourselves together. We need to rebuild our families and rebuild our homes and rebuild ourselves. We need to do every bit of that. But be careful, it won't be enough. For all of the coming together of everything, it will not 
be enough. You got to do it. It's important that we do it. But we can rebuild our families. We can reorganize our church. We can put all the pieces together like they belong. We can do all the right things we know to do. And it's not enough. We need something else. And so the Lord says to Ezekiel, preach to the wind. You call on the wind and you say, come O wind, and you breathe on these who were slain that they may live. The breath of God. It's that breath that bleed, that breathed into a lump of clay and it became a living soul, a human being. The Spirit of God that moved over the void and all of creation was made. It's the Spirit of God that entered a room with 120 people like a great wind. And they came alive. And they found courage. There is a power that you and I do not have in ourselves that without it, we are dead. But when God gives it, we come alive. In that valley, when Ezekiel spoke to the wind, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, there was a spark in a thousand pair of eyes. All of a sudden, the chest of a thousand bodies started rising and falling and rising and falling. All of a sudden, those who were dead stood up and they started to shout and they started to sing and they started to dance and together they became a great host. You and I need to call on the four winds that new life might be breathed into us. But when you do this, be sure you're tying your shoes. Because something is about ready to happen. You're going to rise up. You're going to find a voice. You're going to feel like you want to sing and like you want to dance. Because you're going to be breathing the very breath of God. My prayer today is that together we'll call on the four winds. Come, Holy Spirit, make our dry bones rise. Come, come alive, come alive, come alive, dry bones. Let's pray. Father, we don't have to be convinced about the deadness that's in us and deadness that's all around us. And like those 3,000, there is nothing we like more than to have what some of those, those folk caught. So right now we call on the four winds, Lord. Come, make us rise up. Make us be alive. Not only for our sake, for our family's sake, for the world's sake. And I pray this in Christ's name. Amen.